Hello and welcome into another episode of Locked On Wolves. Today on the show, the first kind of sort of post-game podcast of the season, the Wolves beat the Miami Heat by 10 in the preseason opener, plus a couple of notes from some NBA.com season previews and Bleacher Report, uh, their thoughts on the Timberwolves season, what to look out for, my reaction to their thoughts, uh, where they're right and where they're wrong. We'll talk all about it on the show here today. Welcome in. You are Locked On Wolves. You are Locked On Timberwolves. Your daily Minnesota Timberwolves podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Wolves podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. My name is Ben Beacon. I'm the host of Locked on Wolves. Happy Wednesday, everybody. Happy hump day. Hopefully you're having a fantastic week so far. And welcome to the first kind of sort of semi post game podcast. We'll talk all about uh, the preseason game as much as we can uh, glean from a preseason game on Tuesday night here on the show and a lot more. A big thank you for making Locked on Wolves your first listen every day. Of course, Locked on Wolves is free and available everywhere including YouTube, as well as all of your favorite audio platforms from Apple to Google, Spotify to Odyssey, and more. You can also follow the show on Twitter at Lockdown T Wolves and at B Beacon with two B's, two E's, C K E N. Uh, also, a reminder you can find Lockdown Wolves as well as all the other Lockdown Minnesota podcasts. So, all your favorite Minnesota sports has a Lockdown podcast. They're all available now on the brand new Lockdown Sports Minnesota app on Roku and Amazon Fire TV. More great local sports coverage 24-7, and it's absolutely free. Download the free Locked On Sports Minnesota app on either Roku or Amazon Fire TV. We definitely appreciate the support, and it's a really great way to uh, to watch the show um, every day. All right, so Tuesday night, the Wolves were in Miami. They beat the Miami Heat by 10. Of course, a lot of guys not playing for both teams. We knew that Carl Anthony Towns wasn't going to play. Of course, he was ill, has barely returned to practice. Um, Rudy Gobert did not play. We knew that ahead of time. We talked about that on Tuesday's show, uh, just additional rest following his overseas play throughout the summer. And then D'Angelo Russell, it was announced later in the day he wouldn't dress. Doesn't seem like there's an injury there at all. There's been no report of that. So it, it probably more is just a, hey, he's going to play a lot this year. D'Lo is also a guy we know he, he's he got a lot of miles. He gets banged up, especially for a guy who plays very much below the rim. He's had some knee issues and stuff. And so, you know, why why bother if Rudy and Cat aren't going to play? Um it's a little bit different when it comes to Ant to Jaden McDaniels. Those guys still could use reps. Um, now, I wouldn't be surprised at all. This is just speculation. If Ant sits on Thursday in the preseason game, I mean, why you know why run him out there twice in in three days uh, when he's going to play hopefully 70, 75 plus games this season? Um, on Miami side, uh, Jimmy Butler didn't play. Victor Oladipo didn't play. Um, Gabe Vincent. Those would be the the biggest names of players who just kind of sat out. Um, so it was a relatively, I mean, you still had Kyle Lowry out there. Tyler Hero played quite a bit. He actually was second on, on the heat in minutes in this game. Um, so you, you had outside of maybe the biggest stars, certainly the biggest star on both teams, um, in the Wolves case, three of their best four players not playing. Um, you know, there was still some competitive basketball for chunks of this game. It was actually a pretty fun game. Um, the Wolves pulled away kind of in the second quarter and really, really had control for the entire game. But it was the second quarter and kind of that transition to the bench. Torian Prince came off the bench for the Wolves and played really well. Um, I should mention the starting lineup with no Cat, no Rudy, no Delo. Nas started at center. You had uh, Jade McDaniels, uh, well, I guess Kyle Anderson at the four. Um, McDaniels at the three, Edwards at the two. And Jalen Noel also started as well. So Anton, Jalen, and Kyle Anderson, really. Kyle Anderson actually initiated a lot of the offense to start the game. Um, and Anderson was fantastic. He was tied for the team lead in, in plus minus with a plus 14, four assists, five rebounds, two steals, zero points. He actually only had two shot attempts in, in 24 minutes, which is a team high in minutes for Kyle Anderson, somewhat surprisingly, but only squeezed the trigger twice, didn't make a shot. Um, so that was your starting lineup. Torian Prince came off the bench, played really well, 19 points on 12 shots in 20 minutes. And Nate Knight played heavily off the minute, off the bench as well, had 14 and seven in 16 minutes, four of seven shooting, got to the line nine times. Um, so those were kind of your, you know, the, the primary rotation guys. Normally, if you're new to lock that wolves, what we'll do for a post game pod. First of all, we do a 10 minute live postcast following the game. And then we'll do, um, kind of a full, like a 25, 30 minute podcast. I'll do key takeaways, game flow. Um, you know what the number one most important thing is. And then we'll do studs and duds from the game. Not going to do that for the preseason because I mean, Hey, 
nobody deserves to be a dud after one preseason game, um, knocking the rust off. And also it's, it's preseason basketball. So I'll just give you my biggest takeaways from the game. Um, my biggest takeaways were, uh, the aggressive defense the Wolves were playing. I thought that they were really good with getting up, you know, under the guys with the ball, um, getting out, you know, in one-on-one in -on -one situations, isolation situations, just a catch on the perimeter. The Wolves were really getting into, into the heat, which I, you know, expect. The Wolves were good. They were a really aggressive defensive team last year, but it was good to see that energy in the first preseason game. Similarly, going back the other way from a fast break perspective, the Timberwolves were really aggressive in the open floor um, in, in, in fast breaks and, and trying to get the ball down the court. We knew that that's something Chris Finch wanted to do. And, you know, they did it last year as well. Again, but really evident in this game that it was pushing the pace, pushing the pace, pushing the pace. The Wolves were fantastic at that. And lots of guys had nice open floor plays. Jalen Noel, Anthony Edwards, um, Nate Knight even in the open floor looked comfortable. So uh, that's another another key takeaway for me. I think um, the way that, you know, Kyle Anderson was the one I mentioned this already, but he was the primary initiator of the offense, which maybe isn't shouldn't be a surprise. We talked about how he did that uh, at times in Memphis. And he would do that at times in Minnesota, but he essentially, even though he started at power forward, he was initiating offense for this team um, for basically the whole time he was on the floor. Um, Jordan McLaughlin was really good off the bench. That's another takeaway for me. He had four steals in like his first seven minutes, I think, on the floor. Finished with four points, five assists, four steals in the game, two or three shooting, um, and and was just really good. Uh, and that'll be a thing to look for, you know, obviously not preseason, when you get into the regular season, what does that backup point guard rotation look like? If Jalen Noel is playing really well, is it him? Um, is it simply, you know, staggering the rotation so Kyle Anderson initiates a lot of offense based on matchups? Is it Jordan McLaughlin? Is there a chance you have Austin Rivers run offense? Austin Rivers, um, if I was going to get a, give out a dud, I mean, he was 0 of 6 shooting in this game. Didn't play bad. He was good defensively at 3 rebounds, 2 assists, but 21 minutes, which was uh, third on the team in minutes, and um, and it was 0 of 6 shooting. So. Um, you know, I, I think that would be another another thing to keep an eye on moving forward is that point guard rotation. Nothing the Wolves did offensively was groundbreaking other than, again, being aggressive in the open floor, which which is to be expected from a Chris Finch team and from this Timberwolves team based on what we saw last season. Um, those are probably the biggest things. Um, oh, I should say defensively at Tyler Hero, I thought that um, I thought that. Defensively at Tyler Hero, I thought that Jade McDaniels did an extremely good job um, and. Uh, I, it's, you know, early in the game. Um, and then also later in the game, uh, hero and Jade McDaniels knocked, you know, bump knees. Um, and, and J Mac had to come out of the game, but I, I believe the wolf said after the game, it wasn't a big deal. He seemed to be fine. Um, so not, you know, not, a not what you want in a preseason game, but the aggressiveness was good. I mean, hero was actually looked pretty good for the heat as well, which shouldn't be a surprise, but 22 points on in 26 minutes on 14 shots. He was, the best player on the floor for them. Bam Adebayo, I should say, played as well and played extremely well when he was on the floor. Um, there really aren't any other key takeaways. I, I should I should also say Anthony Edwards played extremely well, which, again, another thing that's not to be a surprise. Um, looked really comfortable. Jumper looked good. Shot 9 of 15, 24 points for him tw in just 23 minutes. Three assists, three rebounds, only one turnover. Uh, again, had, had a, a nice dunk in the open floor, looked comfortable in the half court. Um, really solid all around game. If I had to pick three studs in this game for the Wolves, it would be Ant. It would be Jade McDaniels because of the defensive effort on Hero. Um, and then I'd probably go Nate Knight. I mean, obviously, Torian Prince had a really good game, but I think it was really good to see Nate Knight do some stuff off the dribble, have a nice dunk, get the nine free throws in 16 minutes, seven rebounds, uh, but looked really good. I think, I truly think he's going to give Nas a run for his money in terms of backup big minutes behind Rudy and Cat. I think there's a lot of things Nate Knight does as a four that maybe Nas isn't as comfortable doing. So depending on the matchups, Knight's a bit more physical. He's a bit uh, more just solid all the way around, I think, even if Nas kind of has more of those wow moments, right? Nas, is, or Nas, I should say Knight is more of a of a solid, you know, one of those blue collar type guys who who can do a little bit of everything, whereas Nas flashes and he has these moments where he looks fantastic. But sometimes there's just too many holes defensively, some sloppiness on offense. So I, it wouldn't shock me if as as this if as the season wears on. I'm not saying opening night, but depending on matchups and as we get into January, February, March, perhaps Nate Knight gets some of those backup minutes in the front court, and and we see a little bit less, uh, see a little bit less um, of of Nas Reed. But again, 
we're a ways out from that. It was good to see him play really well in the first preseason game, however. Okay. Um, rest of the show, there were a couple of preview pieces on NBA.com and on uh and a bleacher report that I want to that I want to get to here today. So we're gonna do that here next. First, so let's talk about our title sponsors of today's show, or our, our really good friends, I guess I should say, over at Prize Picks. On the Timberwolves next preseason game on Thursday. I, I might head over to prize picks and take the over on Anthony Edwards points. And it's probably any for a preseason game. It's probably what 19 and a half, 20 points, something like that. Who knows how many minutes he's going to play, but I mean, he looks great. I would definitely take the over on points at prize picks. If you don't know, if you're not familiar with prize picks, it's super, super easy. All you do is pick two to five players. And if they will, if they score more or less than their prize picks projection. And again, it's not just points. I mean, you could take, you, know, you can take D'Angelo Russell over and assist, Rudy Gobert over in blocks, um, you know, whoever they're playing uh, under in whatever category you want or whichever direction you want to go in any of those lines or any of those numbers. Really easy. You can win up to 10 times your money on any entry. It's not competing against other people. It's just you versus the projections available. Prize Picks offers projections on any sport that you watch. This includes the NBA, the NFL, the MLB, NHL, PGA, college football, college basketball, men's and women's, soccer, WNBA, esports. NASCAR, tennis, et cetera, et cetera, on and on and on. Basically every single sport. Entries can be made in 60 seconds or less. It's super easy, safe and fast withdrawals. And currently it's operational in over 30 states and Canada. Download the Prize Picks app or go to prizepicks.com to sign up and play daily fantasy sports. First time users can receive a 100% instant deposit match up to $100 with promo code locked on. If you deposit $100, Prize Picks will give you $100. If you deposit $50, they'll give you $50. Don't forget to enter the promo code locked on at sign up at prizepicks.com for an instant deposit match up to $100. Again, prizepicks.com promo code locked on for an instant deposit match up to Thanks again for making Lockdown Wolves your first listen every day. A reminder that you can check out the ultimate pro basketball preview starting Monday, October 10th, this coming Monday, a six-episode extravaganza to get you ready for the NBA season. The local team experts and the NBA insiders of the Lockdown Podcast Network and Odyssey all combined into one ultimate NBA preview starting October 10th. That's this Monday. Search for Ultimate Pro Basketball Preview 2022 on your Odyssey app, YouTube, or wherever you get your podcasts. Uh, yours truly was part of a round table with some on the rise team hosts, lockdown Grizzlies, lockdown Raptors, um, lockdown Pelicans, lockdown Cavaliers. I think that was it. Uh, moderated by, uh, or led by Nick Angstad, the host of lockdown Mavs. We had a great discussion. Lots of teams kind of in the same realm as the wolves. Um, so be sure to check that out next week, starting October 10th on, uh, the Odyssey app, YouTube, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Okay. Um, so we're kind of in this, this preview mode now preseason started, everybody's getting their thoughts out on paper over the airwaves, the, um, the podcast, the pod waves, if you will. Um, so a couple of quick notes I do. So the ESPN, or excuse me, the NBA.com GM survey came out, but that's a ton of fun. I'm going to do a whole episode on that Thursday. That'll be tomorrow's episode. Um, so you can go check it out prep for that if you want, but I'm going to talk through my thoughts. I think there's some really intriguing things there. But I want to spend, I want to dedicate some more time to it. So a couple of other preview things came out that I want to focus on today. Um, one is at NBA.com. Um, at NBA.com, there, uh, let's see, it was Sean Powell, the writer, came up with what to expect from all 15 teams in the West. I'll be honest with you. When I saw the headline, I expected a bit more out of this article. It's like five sentences on each team. I'll read what he says about the Wolves, and, and then I'll tell you why I think it's kind of like, I don't know why. He says, this will be year one of the Rudy Gobert experiment, and there's plenty on the line for the Wolves to make all of that draft capital they surrendered to get Gobert from Utah worthwhile. How he and Carl Towns mesh will dictate how effective the Wolves will be in their quest to overwhelm opponents with size and mis mismatches. That said, their best player is Anthony Edwards. He demonstrated as much in the 2022 playoffs, and the youngster is thirsty for respect in a spot on the All-NBA team. Um, I, I don't. This isn't framed as a projection piece. Um, it's it's just a you know what to expect. So I 
I mean, I guess maybe he's projecting that Ant is at the end of this year the best player on the team. I don't think there's any question that uh, Carl Anthony Towns and Rudy Gobert are the two best players sitting here right now in a vacuum on October 5th, 2022. In six months, we may feel differently. That would be a pretty massive leap from Ant. It would be, as we've talked about on the show before, and I also talked about, by the way, on the on the roundtable for the Odyssey show um, that'll air next week, that if Ant takes a John ja Morant-like jump in year three, then sure, that's a reasonable conversation to have. Ja, ja, everybody feels like Ja is a top 15. Some people even think he's a top 10, 12 player. Now, I wouldn't go that far because he's got to improve defensively. But if on the offensive side of the floor, Ant takes a jaw like leap, he could actually be better than Rudy or better than Cat by the end of this season. But right now, because of what Rudy's done defensively throughout his career, including last season and done on the glass, and he still can be a functional offensive player, Carl Towns is one of the best probably five offensive players in the entire league. Um, so, I mean, saying that Ant is better than both of them now is kind of crazy. But of course, the ceiling is there, right? The ceiling for Ant, there really isn't one. Um, and and I, I I don't need to say much more about that. But Ja, in his first and second year, it was really similar to Ant. Year three, Ja became so much more efficient. His, his jumper improved a little bit. He became better um, at picking his spots. There were so many things he just improved at in year three as the game continued to slow down, which I know is a cliche, but it's a real thing. And we're there. I, I mean, we're now in year three for Ant. And Ant is already so much better than John Morant defensively. And it's really not even all that close. He's just a better defensive player all the way around. He's bigger. Um, knock on wood should be, you know, I obviously hope Jaw's durable too. But the way that Jaw plays and combined with his frame, you know, Ant should be more durable, um, you know, longer term than Jaw. Hopefully they both are. But there's things about Ant that just, clearly are more attractive in terms of a profile of, of a superstar player. And we'll talk, I want to talk more about the jaw ant thing when it comes to the uh, NBA GM survey, by the way, as a little bit of a teaser for Thursday, because there's some jaw stuff in there that I think, I think we're putting, we're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves um, collectively when it comes to John Morant. I don't want to turn this into a John Morant, you know, this podcast or anything, but uh, you know, Anthony Edwards, there's a real shot that at the end of this season, he's a better player. Than John Morant. So um, I guess you could put me down for voting Anthony Edwards for player most likely to make a leap this season on that survey. Were I to be a GM, I would definitely, I would definitely co-sign that, um, which by the way, he's on that list too. We'll talk about that tomorrow. So I just thought, I thought that this little blurb at NBA.com by Sean Powell was kind of, um, it didn't really say much, obviously Rudy and Kat, everyone's watching that. Um, but the Edwards leap, it hasn't happened yet. The incremental improvement happened last year, absolutely improved, but just wait till after this season. This is this is the year when that leap very well could happen. And you're talking about, you know, already, according to the ESPN top 100, they have they're the only team with three players in the top 25 um, and say what you will about that list. But even if it's not entirely accurate, they're probably the only team, you know, with three players in the top 30 or 35 or whatever you want to call it. This is a real big three that this team has now. And that doesn't even mention D'Angelo Russell, a former all star contract year, entry of the prime of his career, best season last year, all the way around. Um, since his all-star season several years ago in Brooklyn. So this is a really, really good roster. Um, and Anthony Edwards could still very well end up being the best player on the roster by the end of the season. Okay, um, let's close by this Bleach Report article talking about Carlton Towns and Rudy Gobert coexisting. It's an idea that I've talked about a lot on the show. Um, but I, I think it's interesting to see what the national folks, the people that don't cover the team in, in, in you know specifically, what they're saying about it, right? What they're saying about about the the Towns Rudy pairing, and then giving my thoughts on their thoughts uh, to to kind of give more of a, a local perspective. Somebody who does cover the team on a daily basis, uh, what what my take on their take is. So we'll do that here next to close the show. All right, closing the show today with a bit more Rudy Cat talk. This article is at Bleacher Report. It's Andy Bailey who does a fantastic job over there. He did uh, wrote up an article that's every NBA team's biggest question for the season. And perhaps not surprisingly, the national question is how do Carl Anthony Towns and Rudy Gobert coexist? Before I even read what he said, let me point out, this is another thing that I said on the, the, uh, uh, the roundtable that airs next week on the Odyssey season preview. 
is that this narrative, this question nationally of like, how do towns and Rudy coexist? I don't know that that's really the question. Um, right. It's obviously people are going to be paying attention to it because they're both centers and I get it. But as I've said at length, cats played with bigs that function like Rudy, just not as good on offense. The question is more on defense. And, and, and Andy mentions that to his credit in this article. Um, but I don't know if that's the biggest question for the Wolves. Like, good players could figure out how to play with good players. Remember, there was all this hand-wringing about this is different. But, like, Kevin Durant joining the Warriors. Like, how is that going to work? How are LeBron and Dwayne Wade going to work? There was a moment where everybody was worried about that. If you go back even further. Um, there's obviously been some, you know, things that haven't worked out. But for different reasons than the actual on-court meshing. Because good players that want to be, or great players that want to win, they'll figure it out. They're great players, right? Like, more is more, I guess, for, to put it like ultra crudely, simply. Um, and, and so adding talent to talent is almost always going to, to be successful. So I think a bit of this hand wringing nationally is, is, you know, if we want to complain about what they gave up for Rudy Gobert, fine. They have a lot of picks, but uh, to worry a ton about the fit seems to be a, a bit of a waste of time, but I'll read what he says. He says, offensively, it's actually pretty easy to see how Rudy and cat will coexist. The former is one of the best rim runners in the league. Uh, that's Rudy. His screening and dives to the rim consistently pull defenders to the paint, as I've talked about on the show. Uh, his roll gravity, right? So when Rudy rolls or dives to the paint, people have to follow him. He's gigantic. He's got a huge wingspan. He shoots 70 plus percent from around the rim. He pulls defenses in. And then Bailey says that should give Cat one of the best shooting bigs of all time. Correction, the best shooting big of all time is what he should have said. Precious extra time on catch and shoot opportunities. The most intriguing poten potentiality might be four or five pick and rolls with the two All-Stars. Minnesota Timberwolves coach Chris Finch was an offensive assistant who had a lot to do with Nikola Jokic's breakout in 16-17. And I'll add, as an aside, he was in New Orleans prior to that when both Boogie Cousins and Anthony Davis were there. Uh, back to the article, Bailey says, perhaps he'll entrust Towns with a bit with a little playmaking responsibility too. The bigger question is how this works on defense. Gobert will fill his role just fine, but the idea of Cat chasing some stretch and playmaking fours around is daunting. With Gobert, Anthony Edwards, and Jaden McDaniels, Minnesota may have enough plus defenders in the lineup to cover for Towns, but it's far from a given. So I don't really disagree with most of this, right? I think the offense, he spends a lot of time talking about different things they could do on offense, which is 100% true. Um, I've talked about this at length. Just run more pick and rolls. Get Cat more catch and shoot opportunities where he shoots 41% from three. Have Cat do a big, big pick and roll. Initiate. Uh, play horn sets where you have Gobert diving and Towns popping. Um, you know, you can do all kinds of things. Defensively, I, you know, this was, this is really the only concern, but I also don't worry all that much about it, right? If the Wolves want to play a high, a high wall blitzing pick and roll scheme like they've done in past years, or I should say last year specifically, do that. Cat's good at that. And Rudy's your low man instead of Jared Vanderbilt, right? Vando's great, but he's undersized, wasn't a rim protector at all. Uh, Rudy's a lot bigger <laughs> and is the best rim protector of this generation. So, like, you could be aggressive on the perimeter. Rudy's got your back in the paint. Or if you want to play drop with Rudy involved in, in the action, and then Towns is your low man, which is, is his best role. But Towns isn't horrible in the paint. The problem is when he's backpedaling and drop coverage is when he's really exposed. Or if he gets put in a bad way on the perimeter, which could happen at times if teams choose to go five out and try and challenge the Wolves that way, which is what we saw teams do to Utah in the playoffs last year. But... The Wolves have a ton of flexible and versatile defenders. Jade McDaniels can guard fours on the perimeter, and 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 teams will will likely, almost surely, try and hunt Carl Anthony Towns to try and go at that matchup. But then you still have Rudy behind him. So as long as Cat can avoid foul trouble, Rudy's still guarding the paint. Uh, Jade McDaniels can still switch on to guys. Like There's ways around this. Um, the biggest thing is foul trouble. Towns is not a bad defender. It's He was put in the wrong position too many times and too often paired with bad perimeter defenders. Um, and he had to make choices. And sometimes it was, Hey, I'm going to be in foul trouble. And other times it was like, Hey, I'll back off. People tell me I'm not trying, or I'm not a rim protector and he's not a rim protector, but he's better in the paint than say Jared Vanderbilt was defensively. So if you have Rudy involved in drop pick and roll coverage and you can have towns on the back line, that's not a bad spot to be in. Um, so you can, you can mix up your pick and roll coverages. You can mix up your defenses. Um, if you're Chris Finch and I mean, like, there's a lot to like there. So, yes, the biggest question is going to be the defensive fit. We've known that for a while. Um, but I, I just don't think it's quite as dire of a situation as uh, some may have it 
have you think that it is. All right, Thursday show, I want to spend that whole show talking about the NBA.com GM survey. It's one of my favorite shows of the year because it's just so fascinating. We'll talk about stuff beyond the Wolves as well, but a lot of Timberwolves mentions, as you might expect, in this survey. Um, also, one player that never comes up in the survey, unless I missed it. I, I'll reread it. There's a player that I, I was shocked on the Timberwolves, never was mentioned in the survey, probably the first time that that's been the case since he came to the league. So we'll talk about that on Tuesday's show. We'll also do a quick preview of the preseason game Tuesday evening on, I believe it's Lakers on ESPN, if I'm not mistaken. Actually, let me just make sure that that's true. But I believe Thursday is Lakers on ESPN. Uh, yeah, Lakers, 9 p.m. Central, ESPN. Uh, that's the neutral site game in Vegas. So that's we'll, Friday's show, then will be the post-game pod. We'll dig into that uh, a bit more on Friday. So a big week coming up. A big thank you once again to those of you that do make Lockdown Wolves your first listen every day. Of course, you can find the show anywhere you listen to podcasts. Free and available everywhere, including YouTube, as well as all of your favorite audio platforms from Apple to Google, Spotify to Odyssey. You can also follow on Twitter at Lockdown T Wolves and at B Beacon with two B's, two E's, C K. E-N. Of course, the Locked On Wolves podcast is part of the Locked On Podcast Network. The Locked On Network is your local experts on all the biggest stories. Right now, you can make your second listen, the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Show with the fantastic Josh Lloyd. He hosts the number one daily fantasy basketball show on the planet. It's free and available wherever you get podcasts. Once again, I'm Ben Beacon. This is the Locked On Wolves podcast, and we'll catch you next time.